Chapter 4 The Explosive Bubbles of the Early 2000s From Rudyard Kipling, If If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Financially devastating as the bubbles of the last decades of the 20th century were, they cannot compare with those of the first decade of the 21st century. When the Internet bubble popped in the early 2000s, over $8 trillion of market value evaporated. It was as if a year's output of the economies of Germany, France, England, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, and Russia had completely disappeared. The entire world economy almost crashed when the U.S. real estate bubble popped, and a prolonged world recession followed. In the late 2010s, we experienced an enormous bubble in the prices of Bitcoin. Comparing any of these bubbles to the tulip bulb craze is undoubtedly unfair to the flowers. The Internet Bubble Most bubbles have been associated with some new technology, as in the Tronics boom, or with some new business opportunity, as when the opening of profitable new trade opportunities spawned the South Sea Bubble. The Internet was associated with both. It represented a new technology, and it offered new business opportunities that promised to revolutionize the way we obtain information and purchase goods and services. The promise of the Internet spawned the largest creation and largest destruction of stock market wealth of all time. Robert Schiller, in his book Irrational Exuberance, describes bubbles in terms of positive feedback loops. A bubble starts when any group of stocks, in this case those associated with the excitement of the Internet, begin to rise. The updraft encourages more people to buy the stocks, which causes more TV and print coverage, which causes even more people to buy, which creates big profits for early Internet stockholders. The successful investors tell you how easy it is to get rich, which causes the stocks to rise further, which pulls in larger and larger groups of investors. But the whole mechanism is a kind of Ponzi scheme where more and more credulous investors must be found to buy the stock from the earlier investors. Eventually, one runs out of greater fools. Even highly respected Wall Street firms joined in the hot air float. The venerable investment firm Goldman Sachs argued in mid-2000 that the cash burned by the dot-com companies was primarily an investor sentiment issue and not a long-term risk for the sector or space, as it was often called. A few months later, hundreds of Internet companies were bankrupt, proving that the Goldman Report was inadvertently correct. The cash burn was not a long-term risk. It was a short-term risk. Until that moment, anyone scoffing at the potential for the new economy was a hopeless Luddite. The Nasdaq Index, an index essentially representing high-tech new economy companies, more than tripled from late 1998 to March 2000. The price earnings multiples of the stocks in the index that had earnings soared to over 100. A broad-scale high-tech bubble. Surveys of investors in early 2000 revealed that expectations of future stock returns ranged from 15% per year to 25% or higher. For companies such as Cisco and JDS Uniphase, widely known as producing the backbone of the Internet, 15% returns per year were considered a slam dunk. But Cisco was selling at a triple-digit multiple of earnings and had a market capitalization of almost $600 billion. If Cisco grew its earnings at 15% per year, it would still be selling at a well above average multiple 10 years later. And if Cisco returned 15% per year for the next 25 years, and the national economy continued to grow at 5% over the same period, Cisco would have been bigger than the entire economy. There was a complete disconnect between stock market valuations and any reasonable expectations of future growth. And even blue-chip Cisco lost over 90% of its market value when the bubble burst. As for JDS Uniphase plotting its prices against the Nasdaq index, the bubble in the overall index is hardly noticeable. In the name game during the Tronix boom, all manner of companies added the suffix Tronix to increase their attractiveness. The same happened during the Internet mania. Dozens of companies, even those that had little or nothing to do with the net, changed their names to include web-oriented designations such as .com, .net, or Internet. 
Companies that changed their names enjoyed an increase in price during the next 10-day period that was 125% greater than that of their peers, even when the company's core business had nothing whatsoever to do with the net. In the market decline that followed, shares in these companies became worthless. Investors suffered punishing losses, even in the leading internet companies. Palm Pilot, the maker of personal digital assistants, PDAs, is an example of the insanity that went well beyond irrational exuberance. Palm was owned by a company called 3Com, which decided to spin it off to its shareholders. Since PDAs were touted as a sine qua non of the digital revolution, it was assumed that Palm Pilot would be a particularly exciting stock. In early 2000, 3Com sold 5% of its shares in Palm in an initial public offering and announced its intention to spin off all the remaining shares to the 3Com shareholders. Palm took off so fast that its market capitalization became twice as large as that of 3Com. The market value of the 95% of Palm owned by 3Com was almost $25 billion greater than the total market capitalization of 3Com itself. It was as if all of 3Com's other assets had been worth a negative $25 billion. If you wanted to buy Palm Pilot, you could have bought 3Com and owned the rest of 3Com's business for minus $61 per share. In its mindless search for riches, the market created bizarre anomalies. Yet another new issue craze. In the first quarter of 2000, 916 venture capital firms invested $15.7 billion in 1,009 startup internet companies. It was as if the stock market was on steroids. As happened during the South Sea bubble, many companies that received financing were absurd. Almost all turned out to be dot-com catastrophes. Consider the following examples of Internet startups. Digisense offered a computer peripheral that would make websites and computer games smell. The company ran through millions trying to develop such a product. Flues offered an alternative currency, Flues, that could be emailed to friends and family. In order to jumpstart the company, Flues.com turned to an old business school maxim that any idiot can sell a $1 bill for 80 cents. Flues.com launched a special offer to American Express Platinum card holders, allowing them to buy $1,000 of Flues currency for just $800. Shortly before declaring bankruptcy, Flues itself was flused when Filipino and Russian gangs bought $300,000 of its currency using stolen credit card numbers. Consider Pets.com. The company had a sock puppet mascot that starred in its TV commercials and appeared at a Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The popularity of its mascot did not compensate with the fact that it's hard to make a profit individually shipping low-margin 25-pound bags of kibble. The names alone of many of the Internet ventures stretch credulity. Bunions.com, Crayfish, Zap.com, Gadzooks, Fogdog, Fatbrain, Jungle.com, Scoot.com, and MyLackey.com. And then there was EasyBoard.com, which produced internet pages called Toilet Paper to help you get the poop on the online community. These were not business models, they were models for business failure. TheGlobe.com My most vivid memory of the IPO boom dates back to an early morning in November 1998 when I was being interviewed on a TV show. While waiting in my suit and tie in the green room, I thought how out of place it was to be sitting next to two young men dressed in jeans who looked like teenagers. Little did I realize that they were the first superstars of the internet boom and the featured attractions on the show. Stefan Paterno and Todd Kreiselman had formed TheGlobe.com in Todd's dorm room at Cornell. The company was an online message board system that hoped to generate large revenues from selling banner advertising. In earlier times, one needed actual revenues and profits to come to market with an IPO. TheGlobe.com had neither. Nevertheless, its bankers, Credit Suisse First Boston, brought it to market at a price of $9 per share. The price immediately soared to $97, at that time the largest first-day gain in history, giving the company a market value of nearly $1 billion and making the two founders multimillionaires. That day we learned that investors would throw money at businesses that only five years before would not have passed normal due diligence hurdles. The initial public offering of TheGlobe.com was the catalyst 
that launched the pathological phase of the internet bubble. The relationship between profits and share price had been severed. As for Paterno, a CNN segment in 1999 caught him at a New York nightclub dancing on a table in shiny plastic black pants with his trophy model girlfriend. On camera, Paterno was heard to say, got the girl, got the money, now I'm ready to live a disgusting, frivolous life. Paterno and Kreiselman became known as the global poster boys of internet excess. The globe.com closed its website in 2001. Paterno may no longer be living a disgusting life, but in 2010, he served as executive producer of the independent film Down and Dirty Pictures. While the party was still going strong in early 2000, John Doerr, a leading venture capitalist with the preeminent firm of Kleiner Perkins, called the rise in internet-related stocks the greatest legal creation of wealth in the history of the planet. In 2002, he neglected to write that it was also the greatest legal destruction of wealth on the planet. Security Analysts Speak Up Wall Street's high-profile securities analysts provided much of the hot air floating the Internet bubble. Mary Meeker of Morgan Stanley, Henry Blotchett of Merrill Lynch, and Jack Grubman of Solomon Smith Barney became household names and were accorded superstar status. Meeker was dubbed by Barron's the Queen of the Net. Blodgett was known as King Henry, while Grubman acquired the sobriquet Telecom Guru. Like sports heroes, each of them was earning a multi-million dollar salary. Their incomes, however, were based not on the quality of their analysis, but rather on their ability to steer lucrative investment banking business to their firms by implicitly promising that their ongoing favorable research coverage would provide continuing support for the initial public offerings in the aftermarket. Traditionally, a Chinese wall was supposed to separate the research function of Wall Street firms, which is supposed to work for the benefit of investors, from the very profitable investment banking function, which works for the benefit of corporate clients. But during the bubble, that wall became more like Swiss cheese. Analysts were the very public cheerleaders for the boom. Blodgett flatly stated that traditional valuation metrics were not relevant in the big bang stage of an industry. Meeker suggested in a flattering New Yorker profile in 1999 that this is a time to be rationally reckless. Their public comments on individual stocks made prices soar. Stock selections were described in terms of powerful baseball hits. A stock that would be expected to quadruple was a four-bagger. More exciting stocks might be ten-baggers. Securities analysts always find reasons to be bullish. Traditionally, ten stocks are rated buys for each one rated sell. But during the bubble, the ratio was almost 100 to 1. When the bubble burst, the celebrity analysts faced death threats and lawsuits, and their firms faced investigations and fines by the SEC. Blodgett was renamed the Clown Prince of the Internet Bubble by the New York Post. Grubman was ridiculed before a congressional committee for his continuous touting of WorldCom stock and investigated for changing his stock ratings to help obtain investment banking business. Both Blodgett and Grubman left their firms. Fortune magazine summed it all up with a picture of Mary Meeker on the cover and the caption, Can we ever trust Wall Street again? New Valuation Metrics In order to justify ever higher prices for Internet-related companies, security analysts began to use a variety of new metrics that could be used to value the stocks. After all, the new economy stocks were breed apart. They should certainly not be held to the fuddy-duddy old-fashioned standards such as price earnings multiples that had been used to value traditional old economy companies. Somehow, in the brave new internet world, sales, revenues, and profits were irrelevant. In order to value internet companies, analysts looked instead at eyeballs, the number of people viewing a web page or visiting a website. Particularly important were numbers of engaged shoppers, those who spent three minutes on a website. Mary Meeker gushed about drugstore.com because 48% of the eyeballs viewing the site were engaged shoppers. No one cared whether the engaged shopper ever forked over any greenbacks. Sales were so old-fashioned, drugstore.com hit $67.50 during the height of the bubble of 2000. A year later, when eyeballs started looking at profits, it was a penny stock. Mindshare was another popular non-financial metric that convinced me that investors had lost their collective minds. 
For example, the online home seller Homestore.com was highly recommended in October 2000 by Morgan Stanley because 72% of all the time spent by Internet users on real estate websites was spent on properties listed by Homestore.com. But Mindshare did not lead Internet users to make up their minds to buy the properties listed and did not prevent Homestore.com from falling 99% from its high during 2001. Special metrics were established for telecom companies. Security analysts clambered into tunnels to count the miles of fiber optic cable in the ground, rather than examining the tiny fraction that was actually lit up with traffic. Each telecom company borrowed money with abandon, and enough fiber was laid to circle the earth 1,500 times. As a sign of the times, the telecom and internet service provider, PSI Net, now bankrupt, put its name on the Baltimore Ravens football field. As the prices of telecom stocks continued to skyrocket well past any normal valuation standards, security analysts did what they often do. They just lowered their standards. The ease with which telecoms could raise money from Wall Street led to massive oversupply. Too much long-distance fiber optic cable, too many computers, and too many telecom companies. In 2002, Mighty WorldCom declared bankruptcy. And the big equipment companies such as Lucent and Nortel, which had engaged in risky vendor financing deals, suffered staggering losses. Most of the trillion dollars thrown into telecom investments during the bubble vaporized. One of the jokes making the rounds of the Internet in 2001 went as follows. Tip of the week. If you bought $1,000 worth of Nortel stock one year ago, it would now be worth $49. If you bought $1,000 worth of Budweiser, the beer not the stock. One year ago, drank all the beer and traded in the cans for the nickel deposit, you would have $79. My advice to you, start drinking heavily. By the fall of 2002, the $1,000 put into Nortel stock was worth only $3. The rights, W-R-I-T-E-S, of the media. The bubble was aided and abetted by the media which turned us into a nation of traders. Like the stock market, journalism is subject to the laws of supply and demand. Since investors wanted more information about Internet investing opportunities, the supply of magazines increased to fill the need. And since readers were not interested in downbeat skeptical analyses, they flocked to those publications that promised an easy road to riches. Investment magazines featured stories such as Internet stocks likely to double in the months ahead. As Jane Bryant Quinn remarked, it was investment pornography. Softcore rather than hardcore, but pornography all the same. A number of business and technology magazines devoted to the Internet sprang up to satisfy the insatiable public desire for more information. Wired described itself as the vanguard of the digital revolution. The industry standards IPO tracker was the most widely followed index. Business 2.0 was the oracle of the new economy. The proliferation of publications was a classic sign of a speculative bubble. The historian Edward Chancellor pointed out that during the 1840s, 14 weeklies and two dailies covered the new railroad industry. During the financial crisis of 1847, many perished. When the industry standard failed in 2001, the New York Times editorialized, it may well go down as the day the buzz died. Online brokers were also a critical factor in fueling the Internet boom. Trading was cheap, at least in terms of the small dollar amount of commissions charged. Actually, the costs of trading were larger than most online brokers advertised, since much of the cost is buried in the spread between a dealer's bid price, the price at which a customer could sell, and the asked price, the price at which a customer could buy. The discount brokerage firms advertised heavily and made it seem that it was easy to beat the market. In one commercial, the customer boasted that she did not simply want to beat the market, but to throttle its scrawny little body to the ground and make it beg for mercy. In another popular TV commercial, Stuart, the cyber geek from the mailroom, was encouraging his old-fashioned boss to make his first online stock purchase. Let's light this candle. When the boss protested that he knew nothing about the stock, Stuart said, let's research it. After one click on the keyboard, the boss, thinking himself much wiser, bought his first hundred shares. Cable networks such as CNBC and Bloomberg became cultural phenomena. 
across the world, health clubs, airports, bars, and restaurants were permanently tuned in to CNBC. The stock market was treated like a sports event with a pre-game show, what to expect, a play-by-play -play during trading hours, and a post-game show to review the day's action and to prepare investors for the next. CNBC implied that listening would put you ahead of the curve. Most guests were bullish. There was no need to remind a CNBC anchor that just as the family dog that bites the baby is likely to have a short tenure, sourpuss skeptics did not encourage high ratings. The market was a hotter story than sex. Even Howard Stern would interrupt more usual discussions about porn queens and body parts to muse about the stock market and then to tout some particular internet stocks. Turnover reached an all-time high, and there were 10 million internet day traders, many of whom had quit their jobs to go down the easy path to riches. For them, the long term meant later in the morning. It was lunacy. People who would spend hours researching the pros and cons of buying a $50 kitchen appliance would risk tens of thousands on a chat room tip. Terence O'Dean, a finance professor who studies investor behavior, found with his colleagues that most internet traders actually lost money even during the bubble, and that they performed worse the more they traded. The average survival time for the day traders was about six months. Fraud slithers in and strangles the market. Speculative manias, such as the internet bubble, bring out the worst aspects of our system. Let there be no mistake, it was the extraordinary new economy mania that encouraged a string of business scandals that shook the capitalist system to its roots. One spectacular example was the rise and subsequent bankruptcy of Enron, at one time the seventh largest corporation in America. The collapse of Enron, where over $65 billion of market value was wiped out, can be understood only in the context of the enormous bubble in the new economy part of the stock market. Enron was seen as the perfect new economy stock that could dominate the market not just for energy, but also for broadband communications, widespread electronic trading, and commerce. Enron was a clear favorite of Wall Street analysts. Old utility and energy companies were likened by Fortune magazine to a bunch of old fogies and their wives shuffling around to the sounds of Guy Lombardo. Enron was likened to a young Elvis Presley, crashing through the skylight in his skin-tight gold lamé suit. The writer left out the part where Elvis ate himself to death. Enron set the standard for thinking outside the box, the quintessential killer app paradigm-shifting company. Unfortunately, it also set new standards for obfuscation and deception. One of the scams perpetrated by Enron management was the establishment of a myriad of complex partnerships that obfuscated the true financial position of the firm and led to an overstatement of Enron's earnings. Here is how one of the simpler ones worked. Enron formed a joint venture with Blockbuster to rent out movies online. The deal failed several months later. But after the venture was formed, Enron secretly set up a partnership with a Canadian bank that essentially lent Enron $115 million in exchange for future profits from the Blockbuster venture. Of course, the Blockbuster deal never made a nickel, but Enron counted the $115 million loan as a profit. Wall Street analysts applauded and called Ken Lay, Enron's chairman, the mastermind of the year. And the former accounting firm of Arthur Anderson certified the books as fairly stating Enron's financial condition. Wall Street was delighted to collect lucrative fees from the creative partnerships that were established. Deception appeared to be a way of life at Enron. The Wall Street Journal reported that Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling, Enron's top executives, were personally involved in establishing a fake trading room to impress Wall Street security analysts in an episode employees referred to as The Sting. The best equipment was purchased, employees were given parts to play, arranging fictitious deals, and even the phone lines were painted black to make the operation look particularly slick. The whole thing was an elaborate charade. In 2006, Lay and Skelling were convicted of conspiracy and fraud. A broken man, Ken Lay died later that year. One employee who lost his job and his retirement savings when Enron collapsed into bankruptcy took to the web where he sold t-shirts with the message, I got laid by Enron. But Enron was only one of a number of accounting frauds that were perpetrated on unsuspecting investors. 
Various telecom companies overstated revenues through swaps of fiber optic capacity at inflated prices. WorldCom admitted that it had overstated profits and cash flow by $7 billion by classifying ordinary expenses which should have been charged against earnings as capital investments. In far too many cases, corporate chief executive officers, CEOs, acted more like chief embezzlement officers, and some chief financial officers, CFOs, could more appropriately be called corporate fraud officers. While analysts were praising stocks like Enron and WorldCom to the skies, some corporate officers were transforming the meaning of EBITDA from earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization to earnings before I tricked the dumb auditor. Should we have known the dangers? Fraud aside, we should have known better. We should have known that investments in transforming technologies have often proved unrewarding for investors. In the 1850s, the railroad was widely expected to greatly increase the efficiency of communications and commerce. It certainly did so, but it did not justify the prices of railroad stocks, which rose to enormous speculative heights before collapsing in August 1857. A century later, airlines and television manufacturers transformed our country, but most of the early investors lost their shirts. The key to investing is not how much an industry will affect society or even how much it will grow, but rather its ability to make and sustain profits. And history tells us that eventually all excessively exuberant markets succumb to the laws of gravity. The consistent losers in the market, from my personal experience, are those who are unable to resist being swept up in some kind of tulip bulb craze. It is not hard, really, to make money in the market. As we shall see later, an investor who simply buys and holds a broad-based portfolio of stocks can make reasonably generous long-run returns. What is hard to avoid is the alluring temptation to throw your money away on short, get-rich-quick speculative binges. There were many villains in this morality tale. The fee-obsessed underwriters, who should have known better than to peddle all of the crap they brought to market. The research analysts, who were the cheerleaders for the banking departments and who were eager to recommend net stocks that could be pushed by commission-hungry brokers. Corporate executives using creative accounting to inflate their profits. But it was the infectious greed of individual investors and their susceptibility to get-rich-quick schemes that allowed the bubble to expand. And yet, the melody lingers on. I have a friend who built a modest investment stake into a small fortune with a diversified portfolio of bonds, real estate funds, and stock funds that owned a broad selection of blue-chip companies. But he was restless. At cocktail parties, he kept running into people boasting about this internet stock that tripled or that telecom chip maker that doubled. He wanted some of the action. Along came a stock called Boo.com, an internet retailer that planned to sell with no discounts urban chic clothing that was so cool it wasn't even cool yet. In other words, Boo.com was going to sell at full price clothes that people were not yet wearing. But my friend had seen the cover of Time with the headline, Kiss Your Mall Goodbye, Online Shopping is Faster, Cheaper and Better. The prestigious firm of J.P. Morgan and invested millions in the company, and Fortune called it one of the cool companies of 1999. My friend was hooked. This Boo.com story will have all the tape watchers drooling with excitement and conjuring up visions of castles in the air. Any delay in buying would be self-defeating. And so my friend had to rush in before greater fools would tread. The company blew through $135 million in two years before going bankrupt. The co-founder, answering charges that her firm spent too extravagantly, explained, only flew Concorde three times, and they were all special offers. Of course, my friend had bought in just at the height of the bubble, and he lost his entire investment when the firm declared bankruptcy. The ability to avoid such horrendous mistakes is probably the most important factor in preserving one's capital and allowing it to grow. The lesson is so obvious, and yet so easy to ignore. The U.S. housing bubble and crash of the early 2000s. Although the internet bubble may have been the biggest stock market bubble in the United States, 
the bubble in single-family home prices that inflated during the early years of the new millennium was undoubtedly the biggest U.S. real estate bubble of all time. Moreover, the boom and later collapse in house prices had far greater significance for the average American than any gyrations in the stock market. The single-family home represents the largest asset in the portfolios of most ordinary investors, so falling home prices have an immediate impact on family wealth and sense of well-being. The deflation of the housing bubble almost brought down the U.S. as well as the international financial system and ushered in a sharp and painful worldwide recession. In order to understand how this bubble was financed and why it created such far-reaching collateral damage, we need to understand the fundamental changes in the banking and financial systems. A story I like to tell concerns a middle-aged woman who has a serious heart attack. Lying in the emergency room, she has a near-death experience in which she comes face to face with God. Is this it? she asks. Am I about to die? God assures her that she will survive and has 30 more years to live. Sure enough, she does survive, gets stents put in to open up her clogged arteries, and feels better than ever. She then says to herself, If I have 30 more years to live, I might as well make the most of it. And since she's already in the hospital, she decides to undergo what might charitably be called comprehensive cosmetic surgery. Now she looks and feels great. With a jaunty step, she bounds out of the hospital, only to be hit by a speeding ambulance and instantly killed. She goes to the pearly gates and again meets God. What happened? she asks. I thought I had thirty more years to live. I'm terribly sorry, madam, God responds. I didn't recognize you. The New System of Banking If a financier had awakened from a thirty-year nap during the early 2000s, the financial system would have appeared unrecognizable as well. Under the old system, which might be called the originate and hold system, banks would make mortgage loans, as well as loans to businesses and consumers, and hold those loans until they were repaid. In such an environment, bankers were very careful about the loans they made. After all, if a mortgage loan went into default, someone would come back to the loan officer and question the original credit judgment. In this environment, both substantial down payments and documentation were required to verify the credit worthiness of the borrower. This system fundamentally changed in the early 2000s to what might be called the originate and distribute model of banking. Mortgage loans were still made by banks, as well as by big specialized mortgage companies, but the loans were held by the originating institution for only a few days until they could be sold to an investment banker. The investment banker would then assemble packages of these mortgages and issue mortgage-backed securities, derivative bonds securitized by the underlying mortgages. These collateralized securities relied on the payments of interest and principal from the underlying mortgages to service the interest payment on the new mortgage-backed bonds. To make matters even more complicated, there was not just one bond issued against a package of mortgages. The mortgage-backed securities were sliced into different tranches each tranche with different claim priority against payments from the underlying mortgages and each with a different bond rating. It was called financial engineering. Even if the underlying mortgage loans were of low quality, the bond rating agencies were happy to bestow a AAA rating on the bond tranches with the first claims on the payments from the underlying mortgages. The system should more accurately be called financial alchemy, and the alchemy was employed not only with mortgages, but with all sorts of underlying instruments, such as credit card loans and automobile loans. These derivative securities were in turn sold all over the world. It gets even murkier. Second-order derivatives were sold on the derivative mortgage-backed bonds. Credit default swaps were issued as insurance policies on the mortgage-backed bonds. Briefly, the swap market allowed two parties, called counterparties, to bet for or against the performance of the mortgage bonds or the bonds of any other issuer. For example, if I hold bonds issued by General Electric and I begin to worry about GE's credit worthiness, I could buy an insurance policy from a company like AIG, the biggest issuer of default swaps, that would pay me if GE defaulted. The problem with this market was that the issuers of the insurance, such as AIG, had inadequate reserves to pay the claims if trouble occurred. 
and anyone from any country could buy the insurance, even without owning the underlying bonds. Eventually, the credit default swaps trading in the market grew to as much as 10 times the value of the underlying bonds pushed by demand from institutions around the world. This change, where the derivative markets grew to a large multiple of the underlying markets, was a crucial feature of the new finance system. It made the world's financial system very much riskier and much more interconnected. Looser Lending Standards To round out this dangerous picture, the financiers created Structured Investment Vehicles, or SIVs, that kept derivative securities off their books in places where the banking regulators couldn't see them. The mortgage-backed security SIV would borrow the money needed to buy the derivatives, and all that showed up on the investment bank's balance sheet was a small investment in the equity of the SIV. In the past, banking regulators might have flagged the vast leverage and the risk it carried, but that was overlooked in the new finance system. This new system led to looser and looser lending standards by bankers and mortgage companies. If the only risk a lender took was the risk that a mortgage loan would go bad in the few days before it could be sold to the investment banker, the lender did not need to be as careful about the creditworthiness of the borrower. And so the standards for making mortgage loans deteriorated sharply. When I took out my first home mortgage, the lender insisted on at least a 30% down payment. But in the new system, loans were made with no equity down in the hopes that housing prices would rise forever. Moreover, so-called ninja loans were common. Those were loans to people with no income, no job, and no assets. Increasingly, lenders did not even bother to ask for documentation about ability to pay. Those were called no-doc loans. Money for housing was freely available, and housing prices rose rapidly. The government itself played an active role in inflating the housing bubble. Under pressure by Congress to make mortgage loans easily available, the Federal Housing Administration was directed to guarantee the mortgages of low-income borrowers. Indeed, almost two-thirds of the bad mortgages on the financial system as of the start of 2010 were bought by government agencies. The government not only failed as a regulator of financial institutions, but also contributed to the bubble by its own policies. No accurate history of the housing bubble can fail to recognize that it was not simply predatory lenders, but the government itself that caused many mortgage loans to be made to people who did not have the wherewithal to service them. The Housing Bubble The combination of government policies and changed lending practices led to an enormous increase in the demand for houses. Fueled by easy credit, house prices began to rise rapidly. The initial rise in prices encouraged even more buyers. Buying houses or apartments appeared to be risk-free as house prices appeared consistently to go up. And some buyers made their purchases with the objective not of finding a place to live, but rather of quickly selling or flipping the house to some future buyer at a higher price. For the hundred-year period from the late 1800s to the late 1900s, inflation-adjusted house prices were stable. House prices went up but only as much as the general price level. Prices did dip during the Great Depression of the 1930s, but they ended the century at the same level at which they started. In the early 2000s, the house price index doubled. In some cities, prices increased far more than the national average. What we know about all bubbles is that eventually they pop. The decline was broad-based and devastating. Many home buyers found that the amount of their mortgage far exceeded the value of their home. Increasingly, they defaulted and returned the house keys to the lender. In an instance of macabre financial humor, bankers referred to this practice as jingle mail. The effects on the economy were devastating. As home equity collapsed, consumers pulled in their horns and went on a spending strike. And consumers who previously might have taken out a second mortgage or a home equity loan on their house were no longer able to finance their consumption in that manner. The drop in house prices destroyed the value of the mortgage-backed securities as well as the financial institutions that had eaten their own cooking and held these toxic assets with borrowed money. Spectacular bankruptcies ensued, and some of our largest financial institutions had to be rescued by the government. Lending institutions turned full circle, and credit was shut off both to small businesses and to consumers. The recession that followed in the United States was painful 
and prolonged, exceeded in its intensity only by the Great Depression of the 1930s. Bubbles and Economic Activity Our survey of historical bubbles makes clear that the bursting of bubbles has invariably been followed by severe disruptions in real economic activity. The fallout from asset price bubbles has not been confined to speculators. Bubbles are particularly dangerous when they're associated with a credit boom and widespread increases in leverage both for consumers and for financial institutions. The housing bubble provides a dramatic illustration. Increased demand for housing raised home prices, which in turn encouraged further mortgage lending, which led to further price increases in a continuing positive feedback loop. The cycle of increased leverage involved loosening credit standards and even further increase in leverage. At the end of the process, individuals and institutions alike became dangerously vulnerable. When the bubble bursts, the feedback loop goes into reverse. Prices decline, and individuals find not only that their wealth has declined, but that in many cases their mortgage indebtedness exceeds the value of their houses. Loans then go sour, and consumers reduce their spending. Overly leveraged financial institutions begin a deleveraging process. The attendant tightening of credit weakens economic activity further, and the outcome of the negative feedback loop is a severe recession. Credit boom bubbles are the ones that pose the greatest danger to real economic activity. Does this mean that markets are inefficient? This chapter's review of the internet and housing bubbles seems inconsistent with the view that our stock and real estate markets are rational and efficient. The lesson, however, is not that markets occasionally can be irrational and that we should therefore abandon the firm foundation theory of the pricing of financial assets. Rather, the clear conclusion is that, in every case, the market did correct itself. The market eventually corrects any irrationality, albeit in its own slow, inexorable fashion. Anomalies can crop up, markets can get irrationally optimistic, and often they attract unwary investors. But eventually, true value is recognized by the market, and this is the main lesson investors must heed. I'm also persuaded by the wisdom of Benjamin Graham, author of Security Analysis, who wrote that in the final analysis, the stock market is not a voting mechanism, but a weighing mechanism. Valuation metrics have not changed. Eventually, every stock can only be worth the present value of its cash flow. In the final analysis, true value will win out. Markets can be highly efficient, even if they make errors. Some are doozies as when Internet stocks in the early 2000s appeared to discount not only the future, but the hereafter. Forecasts are invariably incorrect. Moreover, investment risk is never clearly perceived, so the appropriate rate at which the future should be discounted is never certain. Thus, market prices must always be wrong. But at any particular time, it is not obvious to anyone whether they are too high or too low. The evidence I will present next shows that professional investors are not able to adjust their portfolios so that they hold only undervalued stocks and avoid overvalued ones. The best and the brightest on Wall Street cannot consistently distinguish correct valuations from incorrect ones. There is no evidence that anyone can generate excess returns by making consistently correct bets against the collective wisdom of the market. Markets are not always or even usually correct. But no one person or institution consistently knows more than the market. Nor does the unprecedented bubble and bust in house prices during the first decade of the 2000s drive a stake through the heart of the efficient market hypothesis. If individuals are given an opportunity to buy houses with no money down, it can be the height of rationality to be willing to pay an inflated price. If the house rises in value, the buyer will profit. If the bubble bursts and the house price declines, the buyer walks away and leaves the lender, and perhaps ultimately the government, with a loss. Yes, the incentives were perverse. Regulation was lax and some government policies were ill-considered. But in no sense was this sorry episode and the deep recession that followed caused by a blind faith in the efficient market hypothesis. The Bubble in Cryptocurrencies our final bubble of the early 2000s is far less significant in the sense that the entire cryptocurrency market is small 
relative to other asset markets as well as to world economic activity. But the increase in prices for Bitcoin and many of the other cryptocurrencies was even more dramatic than the rise of tulip bulb prices. And the way it captured the imagination of the public as well as the spillover effects to other markets were eerily similar to the madness that accompanied the dot-com bubble. Bitcoin and Blockchain Bitcoin, the worldwide cryptocurrency, has variously been labeled the currency of the future or a worthless fraud whose growth resembles that of a pyramid scheme and is likely to turn out to be one of the greatest financial bubbles of all time. The price of a Bitcoin has oscillated dramatically, rising from pennies per digital token to almost $20,000 at the end of 2017. It has fluctuated by close to 50% in a matter of days, rising or falling by several thousand dollars. Bitcoin was created by an unknown person or persons writing under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. The goal was to create a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash, as he wrote in a white paper published in 2008. The elusive Nakamoto communicated only by email and social media. While several people have been identified as Nakamoto, the real identity of the Bitcoin creator has never been confirmed. After creating the original rules for the Bitcoin network and releasing the accompanying software in 2009, Nakamoto disappeared two years later. He is reported to own a million tokens, which became worth billions of dollars in early 2018 and would have made him one of the richest people in the world. The Bitcoin system works through a secure public ledger called a blockchain, a coded and password protected but anonymous entry on the ledger records ownership of the Bitcoin. The blockchain provides proof of who owns the tokens at any time, as well as the payment history of every Bitcoin in circulation. The network is maintained by independent computers around the world. The payment for maintaining these computers and processing new transactions is made in Bitcoin in a process known as Bitcoin mining. All the tokens in existence were created by this process. There is a maximum limit of 21 million tokens in circulation. When the maximum limit is reached, a different method of payment for maintaining the network will be required, such as the sharing of transaction fees. The blockchain is a continually growing public ledger of records referred to as blocks that are linked to previous blocks and that document transactions on the network. Copies are spread around the computers or nodes of the network so that anyone can check if anything is amiss. This keeps the network honest. If some party helping to maintain the database try to alter their own copy of the records to add money to their own account, other computers would recognize the discrepancy. Conflicts are resolved by consensus and a strong encryption system has thus far made the network secure. By 2018, there were millions of unique users and both legal and illegal transactions were completed through the Bitcoin protocol. The level of the Bitcoin exchange rate does not matter. Transactions can be completed whether the Bitcoin is worth $1 or $20,000. One can buy the cryptocurrency and simultaneously send it to a vendor who can convert it immediately into dollars. As long as the Bitcoin does not fluctuate in value during the short period in which the transaction takes place, the dollar value does not matter. The argument for the disruptive technology involved is that it can allow for seamless and anonymous transactions without the need to go through the banking system and without the use of national currencies. Is Bitcoin real money? Traditional finance professionals have been deeply skeptical of the cryptocurrency phenomenon. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, originally called Bitcoin a worthless fraud and suggested he would fire anyone at his bank who dabbled in the coin. Legendary investors such as Howard Marks and Warren Buffett have suggested that the cryptocurrencies are not real and have no value. But the same can be said for any national currency. A dollar bill has no intrinsic value. All paper currencies suffer from various degrees of skepticism, although they are not normally disparaged as a kind of Ponzi scheme. So let's examine whether Bitcoin and other digital currencies should be considered money or not. What is the definition of money? This may seem an odd question, but in fact, it raises some subtle issues with respect to Bitcoin. 
For an economist, money is what money does. Money performs three functions in the economy. First, it is a medium of exchange. We value money because it enables us to buy goods and services. We keep cash in our wallet so that we can buy a sandwich for lunch and a can of soda when we're thirsty. Second, money is a unit of account, the yardstick that is needed to post prices and record debts now and in the future. The New York Times costs $3 in 2018. If I take out a $100,000 interest-only mortgage at a 5% interest rate, my yearly interest payments will be $5,000, and I will owe $100,000 when the loan matures. Third, money is a store of value. A seller may accept money for the sale of a good or service because she can use the money to buy something in the future. While she might hold another asset, such as common stock to store value, money is the most liquid asset available. Money is the preferred asset to hold for making purchases that are likely to be required over the immediate future. How well does the Bitcoin meet the traditional requirements needed for an asset to be considered money? Bitcoin appears to some extent to meet the first requirement. It is accepted worldwide for many different types of transactions. And while the authentication process is cumbersome, it could potentially involve lower transaction costs for some types of international business dealings affected through the international banking mechanism. For transactions that border on the illegal, it also provides an anonymity that participants value and that undoubtedly makes it the preferred payment vehicle. And it may give the holder somewhat greater assurance that it will be harder to confiscate by some government authority in a country with weak property rights. It is not surprising that most of the early trading in cryptocurrencies has occurred in Asian countries where fears of confiscation are the strongest. It is the extreme volatility in the value of the Bitcoin that makes it fail the second and third common definitions of money. An asset that gains and loses a substantial percentage of its initial value each day will serve neither as a useful unit of account nor as a dependable store of value. It is in this volatility that the peril of the Bitcoin resides. There is no natural anchor for the value of a cryptocurrency. For those who seek to avoid the risk of assuming the high volatility in the Bitcoin marketplace, a further transaction, converting the Bitcoin into an asset or national currency whose value is more stable, will be required. At least for the US dollar and most of the world's major currencies, there is a central bank whose goals involve maintaining the stability of the value of the currency. The situation reminds me of the classic story of the sardine trader who kept a warehouse full of cans of sardines. One day a hungry worker opened one of the cans, hoping for a tasty lunch, but found that the can was filled with sand. Confronting the trader, the worker was told that the cans were for trading, not for eating. It appears that the story applies to Bitcoin as well. For most traders of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, the game was a speculative bet that the price will continue to soar. For those who got into the game early, the rewards have been enormous. Remember the six foot five inch Olympic rower twins, Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss, who accused Mark Zuckerberg of stealing their idea for Facebook when they attended Harvard College? The twins' lawsuit was settled for $65 million and Zuckerberg went on to become a billionaire from his holdings of Facebook stock. Don't feel too bad for the twins, who thought they deserved more money. They took $11 million of the settlement and invested in Bitcoin at $120 per token. By 2017, the twins became Bitcoin billionaires. Should the Bitcoin phenomenon be called a bubble? So what do we conclude? Are we witnessing the dawn of a promising new technology that will greatly improve the international payments mechanism? Or is this simply another speculative bubble that will lead many of the participants to financial ruin? Perhaps the answer is yes to both questions. The blockchain technology behind the Bitcoin phenomenon is real and improved versions could become more widespread. In any event, the international payments mechanism will be profoundly changed by technology the promise of the blockchain and similar distributed ledger technologies is that the systems can be used for other purposes, such as medical records and a history of vehicle repairs. The state of Delaware, which has made a business of incorporating companies from all over the world, 
is working on the use of blockchains for corporate record keeping. Dubai has announced that it wants to have all governmental documents secured on a blockchain by 2020. Similar kinds of decentralized record keeping are associated with other cryptocurrencies that have proliferated after the success of Bitcoin. Technology does have the potential to reduce transactions costs and increase transactions speed. Digital currencies can facilitate secure transactions between sellers and buyers without the mediation of either financial institutions or governments. But because an underlying phenomenon is real does not mean that it is not susceptible to bubble pricing. The promise of the internet was real in the late 1990s, but that did not prevent a company like Cisco Systems, which made the switch which made the switches and routers making up the backbone of the internet from losing 90% of its value when the bubble burst. And there are clear indications that the rise in the prices of Bitcoin and other digital currencies represents a classic bubble. One indication of a speculative bubble is the extent to which the price of the object rises. In a short period of time, the price of a Bitcoin rose from pennies to almost $20,000. In 2010, a Bitcoin could be purchased for less than one cent. Its highest recorded price that year was 39 cents. In 2011, it sold for as much as $31 per token, only to fall to $2 by the end of the year. Large spikes up and down characterized trading over the next several years, but the trend was clearly up. In early January of 2017, a Bitcoin sold for $750. It closed the year at around $14,000, after briefly climbing close to $20,000. The tokens have been extremely volatile, rising or falling by as much as a third in a single 24-hour period. Prices of other cryptocurrencies have followed similar patterns. The price increase far exceeded that of tulip bulbs in 17th century Holland, and none of the bubbles described earlier in this book came close to approximating the inflation of Bitcoin prices. Both the magnitude of the price increases and their volatility are suggestive of one of the biggest bubbles in history. Bubbles are propagated by attractive stories that become part of the popular culture. The Bitcoin story is an ideal example of how a meme has generated special enthusiasm among millennials. Mentions of Bitcoin increasingly appeared in the press, TV, and the movies. Stories about cryptocurrencies have not been limited to financial publications. They've also captured the mainstream media, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies represented the second most searched news item globally in 2017, just after Hurricane Irma on Google Trends. World-famous rapper Pitbull joined a long line of celebrities embracing Bitcoin. Superstars such as Katy Perry and personalities like Paris Hilton introduced the topic on their social media accounts. The stamp of approval was also given by boxing star Floyd Mayweather and soccer legend Lionel Messi. Millions of TV viewers were introduced to the world of cryptocurrencies through serials such as Grey's Anatomy and The Big Bang Theory. The Good Wife contained a full episode about Mr. Bitcoin. Many questions about Bitcoin were asked on Jeopardy. The documentary Banking on Bitcoin described it as a monetary revolution and the most disruptive innovation since the Internet. The Simpsons contained several references to the digital currency, prompting one little boy to ask his parents, if he could have his allowance in Bitcoin. Recall that during the internet bubble at the turn of the century, many companies added the suffixes .com or .net to their names to add luster to their stocks. History repeated itself almost perfectly. Long Island Ice Tea Corp surged 289% after the unprofitable company changed its name to Long Blockchain Corp. The company announced that it would seek to partner with or invest in companies that developed decentralized ledgers. But they neither had any agreements in place, nor could they give any assurance that agreements would be forthcoming. There was a near daily phenomenon of obscure micro-cap companies changing their names to capitalize on some aspect of the cryptocurrency mania. As a result, the price of their stocks soared, sometimes more than tenfold. Nor was the phenomenon confined to the United States. A British company, Online PLC, that had been investing in internet licenses, had its best trading day on record in late 2017. The shares rose 394% after the company announced that it had changed its name to Online Blockchain PLC. 
More examples followed in 2018. The iconic company Eastman Kodak had filed for bankruptcy protection in 2012 when it missed the revolution in digital imagery. While it emerged from bankruptcy the next year and hoped to reignite the business by focusing on digital printing, packaging, and a legacy film business, none of these was successful. But Kodak found new life as a cryptocurrency company. They announced the development of Kodak Coin, a new digital currency that would be used for the purchase and sale of digital content. To ensure that they would miss no opportunity to benefit from the crypto buzz, they also promised to get into the Bitcoin mining business. The stock immediately rose from $2.50 to over $10 per share. My favorite company of the era was the startup Glance Technologies, which attempted the trifecta by combining Bitcoin, FinTech, and Weed. Glance agreed to license its mobile payment platform to a company called Cannabis Big Data Holdings. The plan was to allow retailers to buy marijuana with cryptocurrencies and thus cash in on investors' love affairs with three new businesses. As expected during the mania, Glance's stock price spiked sharply higher. What can make the Bitcoin bubble deflate? Perhaps the major advantage of using Bitcoin as a currency for transactions and as a store of value is its anonymous nature. Digital currency can facilitate transactions so as to circumvent the ability of governments to regulate them. And holding Bitcoin as a store of value provides greater security that it will be more difficult for a government to confiscate the owner's wealth. Upward spikes in Bitcoin prices have often accompanied greater international tensions, and holders of the token often reside in countries with weak rules of law and tenuous property rights. Illegal transactions were often completed with the use of Bitcoin. If you lived in North Korea or Venezuela, or you were a drug dealer, Bitcoin rather than the US dollar was the preferred currency of choice. And Bitcoin transactions have been used in an attempt to avoid international economic sanctions. The growth of Bitcoin transactions has been called an index of money laundering. Transactions in pornography were also a favorite use for digital currencies. Bacchus Entertainment, a company making high-quality micro-fetish porn, was, according to its creators, the first Bitcoin-only porn website. Because what we do is taboo for some people, Saffron and Dennis Bacchus announced, Bitcoin changed everything. Bacchus Entertainment could then stop censoring their videos to please credit card companies' moral policies. Bitcoin allowed the company to avoid credit card fees and keep membership prices low. As a bonus, the transaction did not show up on the buyer's credit card bill. But the use of Bitcoin for illegal transactions creates a danger for the tokens. Governments can be expected to crack down on the use of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for illegal transactions. Governments can threaten to imprison individuals using Bitcoin which would force it into a black market. In 1933, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt made it illegal for Americans to hold gold. All governments have rightly been very particular about their sole right to issue and control currencies. In addition, governments can shut down the exchanges on which cryptocurrencies are traded. Since Bitcoin mining operations use considerable computer power and are energy intensive, Restrictions can be imposed on the computers that run the public distributed ledger central to the transactions network. Creating a single token requires as much electricity as a typical American house consumes in two years. The total network of computers comprising the Bitcoin network consumes as much energy each year as some medium-sized countries. Bitcoin enthusiasts often made their case by emphasizing that the total size of the token market was capped at 21 million. But the argument was flawed. There is no cap on the competing cryptocurrencies that proliferated. Supporters of Ethereum and its currency called Ether would argue that it is superior to Bitcoin. The Ethereum protocol is designed to provide more flexibility and increased functionality. Ripple and its coin named XRP was specifically created to improve international transactions by reducing costs and speeding up transaction times. During 2017, over 700 more cryptocurrencies, some of them fraudulent, were introduced. The total size of all cryptocurrencies in the market is unlimited. The tulip bulb bubble burst when investors and speculators in bulbs finally decided to cash in their profits. Holders of large amounts of Bitcoin are called whales, 
and they can send prices plummeting by selling even a small portion of their holdings. Almost half of all Bitcoin in existence was believed to be held by fewer than 50 holders in 2018. These holders can also potentially band together and manipulate the market. It is not necessarily illegal for big holders to discuss trading strategies with each other. Because Bitcoin is a currency as opposed to a common stock that trades in a highly regulated market, the market is especially treacherous for small individual investors. Finally, if overnight someone broke the underlying encryption system of the Bitcoin protocol, the market could collapse in chaos. There would not be time to update the system's protocol so as to keep everyone's money safe. Technology will ultimately greatly improve the intentional payment system, and there will always be advantages to holding an asset that is anonymous and transportable without a physical trace. But the lessons of history are immutable. Speculative bubbles will persist, but they ultimately lead most of their participants to financial ruin. Even real technology revolutions do not guarantee benefits for investors. Part 2. How the pros play the biggest game in town.